Um, our next speaker is actually a personal favorite of mine. Um, being an interviewer myself, I've always admired her originality, courage, confidence, and trademark wit um, as an interviewer, shedding no fear, having no shame to ask any question she likes. And her brash, extremely witty, sometimes sarcastic and outrageous celebrity interviews are unforgettable. And today, this successful personality is on a mission to forge a new kind of entertainment, a forging between stand-up comedy and scientific lecture. And um, I just want to say a quote that I heard Ruby say once. It's not about the survival of the fittest, but the survival of the wisest. And with that, the ever-lovely Ruby Wax. Hi. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I've been in show business for about 25 years, so you might ask what that has to do with wisdom. Uh, so I'll explain. Um, about seven years ago in the UK, do you want me to explain who I am or that's okay? It's okay, uh, make, make it up. Uh, about uh, seven years ago in the UK, I was suddenly made poster girl for, uh, for mental illness, and uh, I did an audition. It was hoisted upon me, and I'll, I'll explain to you how that happened. Uh, do you know comic relief in this country? Okay, it's a charity. They asked me if, uh, they were given some money to mental health charities, so they asked me if I wanted to uh, pose for a picture, you know, to raise some money for it, so I said, sure. But I thought it was going to be like a tiny little fingernail clipping of a picture, but uh-uh, they surprised me. Uh, you know the underground? Underground, the tubes, yeah. All the way down, all the way down the escalator, there were huge pictures of me, Huge pictures that said on it, I'm not making this up, one in four people have mental illness. <laughs> yeah, gets better. One in five people have dandruff. I have both. <laughs> Couldn't believe, I'm mortified, completely mortified. So um, I thought, you know what I'm going to do? This is, I'm going to write a show, and I'm going to make that look like it's my publicity poster. <laughs> Savvy. So I did. I wrote a show, and I toured it for the next two years in mental institutions. That I did, and I think they liked it. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thank you. I, I, I think they liked it. I couldn't always tell because they weren't always facing the front, but I don't know. But I know the bipolars liked it. They used to say, I laughed, I cried. <laughs> and I had a cult following with the psychotics. They still write to me. I'm going to kill you, <laughs> but it's a fan base. So what I thought I'd do, well, what I did was I'd go into their the institutions everywhere around uh, the UK, and, um, and I'd perform in their smoking rooms, a fantastic atmosphere. Then what would happen is uh, we'd have a little bit of an interval. You know, they'd go off. We used to steal food from the anorexics. They didn't mind. Uh, they'd go off, and then they'd come back in, and we'd have a discussion, and they asked unbelievable questions. And, and one woman, I remember, she asked me, how do you get a poltergeist out of a Hoover? <laughs> I don't know. Can't answer that one. Maybe you can in Sweden. But um, anyway, what happened was that show took off, and it started to go to real theaters around the world, uh, non-institutional, like this. Uh, so it went into Australia, it went to New Zealand, it went to Cape Town, it went to America, London, it went everywhere. And what we'd do is, with the audience, we'd have an interval, and then they'd all come back in and we'd have a discussion. Same thing. But what was amazing to me was that wherever I took the show, really, whatever country it went to, everybody was asking the same question. Everybody was kind of... Um, during the discussion, they would say that they felt their lives were out of control, that they were uh, living at these speeds, and living in a frenzy of busyness, and that they couldn't stop. They couldn't stop, and they were pushed on by these kind of inner critical thoughts. You know, I could have, I shouldn't, I didn't, I screwed up, which was such a relief to me because I thought I was the only one that had those. Because <laughs> I've never had a thought in my head that said, never. What a wonderful thing you're doing. And may I say how attractive you are today. Never had that one. That thought never came in. So again, I thought, I'm going to do, I'm going to write a, I'm going to write a show to maybe answer some of these questions. And it won't be like the old show. It won't be for the one in four with the mental issue. It won't be for the one in five with the dandruff. I would write a new show. A new show, uh, and it would be for everybody, for all of humankind, and therefore widening my audience. So now you're going to see part of the show. Say new world. Thank you. 
Thank you. This is the show. It's not really the show, but it, it, it's part of the show. You know, it's not the real show because <laughs> you didn't pay me, but uh, <laughs> it's a little segment of the show. So uh, um, point one, why are we so busy? Answer, I do not know. Really, why would I know? Honestly, I'm frazzled. I don't, have time. I don't even have time to do this show. Really, I'm going to have to stop halfway through and do some phone calls. I don't, maybe you're going to have to do the second half. Where did this thing start? Does anybody know where this started with the busyness, you know, that suddenly it was prestige to be people coming up to you going, busy? Are you busy? <laughs> Am I busy? Please. Are you bu busy? Bu it was like, it spread like a virus, like a plague. Don't you think it's bizarre that the very thing that's making us nuts is how we check each other out, how well we're doing? And of course, the busier you are, oh my God, then you're important. That's high status. Busy, yes. People come up to me, they go, are you busy? I go, am I busy? I've had a quadruple bypass, I'm on life support. They go, that's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, you must be doing so well. Uh, no, I, every slot is filled for me, really, no time. I've actually devoted my life to answering emails. I'm even answering spam. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, I haven't got erectile dysfunction now, but I'll get back to you. Please, let's keep talking. My fingers are bleeding from the emailing. You know, um, I know when I'll be dying, I'll be in a hospital bed, and my old wither arm is going to come out of there just to push send one more time. You know, all this communication, all this communication, and we're all alone. All alone, all of us are huddled in our little corner, huddled in the darkness, sitting in there by ourselves, once in a while sending out a tweet, like a flare from the sinking Titanic. It's a cry for help. I've sent my memory to the cloud. Now I don't remember how to get it back down again. I, really, I can't, I can't take any more of it. I, I want to wait. wave a white flag and go, please don't tell me anything else. I have no more room at the inn. I can just about take in what the weather is, then I'm exhausted. And there's these people who know everything. You know them. They know everything going on in the world. You know these people. You see them at dinner parties. Yak, yak, yakety yak in away, yak in away, saying things like, you know what I would do if I was Putin? Oh my God, what would you do? <laughs> what would you, because Putin's waiting on the other end of the phone. He would like to know what you would do. Please tell us all. You know what I would tell the Taliban? Oh my God, what would you tell the Taliban? Please. I would tell them to go back where they came from. Go back to Israel. <laughs> experts. Experts. There must be 64 billion experts sitting in coffee shops around the world giving their expert opinion. Oh, and then there are those people, experts also, but they have one piece of information, just one, very important. They spend their lives shoveling together their little mound of research just so they can spew it at you and bore you senseless. I'm always sitting next to that one. You know these ones. You know the ones that are telling you what the Flemish were doing at 2.45 on Tuesday during World War II. <laughs> and I'm thinking, Jesus Christ, should I know this information? <laughs> Does a man think I'm an idiot? Is there going to be a test? And just as my self-esteem is about to hit the floorboards, the phlegm expert whips out another piece of information, like a big swinging genital. <laughs> Can I be honest with you? I don't even know where phlegm mark is. No idea. So that's why when I run into the uh, toilet and I start to Google, thank God for Google, I'm going, phlegm mark, where is it? Putin, what would I do if I was him? I don't even know where Stockholm is, for God's sake. Does it exist? Who knows? Anyway, thank God for Google. Honestly, as far as technology, we're at the top of our game. There's no question. I mean, technology is doing so well, we're, we're going to have to evolve into it. Really, our, our cells will be replaced by silicone chips. We'll grow millions of fingers so we can multitask really well. And then we'll be perfect. We'll be flawless. We'll be, our skin will turn a metally silver, and then we'll have an imprint of an apple where our heart used to be. <laughs> really, we know so much about technology, but we know nothing about our brains. Our minds are running us, we're not running them. 
Our thoughts are jumping, jumping, jumping like moths on cocaine. <laughs> Regurgitating, resenting, regretting. Why wasn't I asked to be in the Olympics? I wasn't even asked to be in the disabled Olympics. <laughs> this brain that knows so much about the world knows so little about itself. It's, it's like we have a Ferrari on top of our heads, but nobody gave us the keys. And then, of course, we blame the world. Yeah, that's why we're such a mess, individually. It's something out there. We blame it on global warming. We blame it on the economy. We blame it on, I don't know, whoever the enemy happens to be. I don't even know who they are anymore. They change every half an hour. <laughs> but the conflict is in our heads, and we project it onto the world. The bully isn't out there. It's in here. Inside of our heads, there will always be war until we declare a truce in our own minds. That is my speech on world peace. Over and out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. OK, point two, why are we screwed? <laughs> Well, I wanted to know, so what I did was um, I crashed a course at a university in neuroscience, as you do, because I thought, let's go to the mothership if we want to find out what's gone wrong. And so I was in this class, and it was, uh, it was filled with 21-year-olds. So uh, I told them I had that disease where you age really fast. <laughs> and, and so we partied. <laughs> yeah, I even dated a couple guys. Then they found out I really was old. <laughs> Didn't matter, because in the end, they liked me because I was the one with the car. <laughs> <laughs> really, um, no, I actually went to university because I wanted to find out what was happening in the mind, ma mainly because I'd lost mine. I, I, was, I was so busy at that time, I was so hyper high on my career, I started to say yes to things I shouldn't have said yes to. Like I remember I once said, oh yes, I would do a particular radio ad. Yeah, I don't know if you recognize me in this country, but in the UK, I am the voice of constipation. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> a few of you might recognize me. Thank you. Then I remember I said, yes, yes, I would interview Donald Trump. Yes, he existed then. <laughs> this man has one nose hair, and then he winds it, <laughs> winds it, winds it around his head. Winds it like a Mr. Whippy. See, if you don't flush them the first time, they come right back up again. Anyway, I decided I would study neuroscience and I would find out why the human race was in such a pickle, and I did. And I would like to give you some of my conclusions now. Yes, okay, some of this is fact, some of this I'm making up. <laughs> What's the difference? You may know this, some of you, but hundreds of millions of years ago, when we were ancient man and we were roaming on the savanna, we were fine. We were fine, we were at one with nature, everything was... We'd hit a little ball with our club sometimes, that was probably the early version of golf, but fine. Anyway, then when uh, we'd feel danger or we'd feel threat behind us, this part deep, deep in our brain called the amygdala would sound an alarm and then it would fill us with cortisol and adrenaline to get us ready to rumble, so we turned from nice guy to killer maniac. Then when the predator came along, we would take him on, and we'd bash him, bash him, bash him, bash him, and when the incident was resolved, and we were still left standing, the cortisol and adrenaline would go down, the amygdala would go down, and we'd go back to being calm and serene again. Now, the problem is these days, we can never be calm. Never, because we're being bombarded by bad news day and night. I mean, our little brain, it can't tell if there's a threat right behind us or something is happening 20,000 miles away. It can't tell the difference, the amygdala, it can't tell. I mean, do I really need to know if there's an active volcano and dum dum dum? <laughs> like I'm not nervous enough? Or a whale has been beached in Malawi? What can I do? What should I do, get an airplane ticket and rent a tow truck? What? Then you get there, do you push it in? Do you pull it out? I don't work with these things. How would I know? You see, the point is we're only supposed to know what our neighbors are up to. Like if the woman next door to me is having sex with the man next door to her, I have to know that. <laughs> but four doors down, none of my business. And if you think physical threat is bad, social threat is way worse. 
Like if you're suddenly made to feel not part of the crowd or you're just not cool enough, that's even worse than being eaten. Do you know if you're not accepted on Facebook, it actually activates exactly the same part of your brain as real physical pain. So you don't get a lot of likes, <laughs> same thing. Then you get even more critical voices. Oh my God, nobody likes me. I'm too fat to wear tights. Oh my God, I must be a loser. I can't twerk as well as Miley Cyrus. Actually, I can. <laughs> and in the real show, I do it, but not here. <laughs> not here, but I can. Um, anyway, the reason we have a proclivity to think negatively, the reason we're a little bit more paranoid than positive is because we're all a throwback from when we were all in the bush, you know, when we were all animals. You remember that. You were there, come on. We were all animals, and we would always be vigilant. We'd check over the mountain to see if danger was coming. We'd always be careful, looking around. Then when language came along, which was only about 100,000 years ago, we started to put words to those feelings of fear and vigilance. So it would translate in, in our heads. We'd go, oh my God, I'm going to get caught. I'm not good enough. Everybody thinks I'm an idiot. I, it's cruel, but it keeps you on your toes. <laughs> Better be safe than sorry. Do you know, every single cell in your body is rooting for your survival. It couldn't give a shit about your happiness. And then, of course, you get even more critical voices depending on mommy and daddy's early warning systems. Like my mother used to say to me, lovingly, I only tell you you're a moron because I'm your mother and I love you. <laughs> it's a miracle I'm alive. Anyway, I've told you why the voices, now I'm going to tell you where are the voices. There are no voices, okay? There are, nobody's up there, no mini-me's living up there shouting abuse at you through a bullhorn. Put it out of your head. The only thing you have up there, I'm sure you know, is this three-pound piece of meat, the most complex thing on the planet, and that's creating the illusion of words. It creates the illusions of these thoughts going through. Okay, so I'll explain to you a little bit what's in the brain. Okay, let's start at the very beginning. A very good place to start. I always like to quote Julie Andrews when I'm talking about neuroscience. <laughs> Most of you know this, just bear with me. Okay, inside here, there are about 100 billion neurons busily zapping information from one to the next. Between each neuron is a tiny gap called a synapse. Chemicals are squirted across that gap, which activate the next neuron to fire. So this is how you communicate, through electrical and chemical impulses. No thought bubbles. So do you understand? No, you don't. Okay. <laughs> All right. Say I'm a neuron, okay? So I get this electric, electric, electric wave, and then between my gap and you, I would spurt my chemical into you. Then you would go electric, electric, electric. Then you'd spurt to that person over there. She'd go electric, 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 spurt. Then we'd spurt, 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 electric. Is that your wife next to you? Okay, then don't spurt on her. Okay, then electric, spurt, spurt, spurt. There's 100 billion of them, and I haven't got time. Okay. There are trillions of bits of information traveling in your brain right now, carrying snippets of information from one region to another. So you could say the inside of our brain is like Las Vegas, where trillions of bits of information are passed along every time you have some information to pass on a gigantic electric grid. So sometimes there's just a little fire and a little, pfft, like a little candle flick, and it might be because you forgot where you parked your car. But the big Beyonce on tour light show happens <laughs> when trillions of neurons send information into your body to do really important things, things that you're not even aware of. Things like, um, close up your sphincter. See, you can't think that. You can't think it. It wouldn't know what you're talking about. Your sphincter doesn't have ears. You must know this here in Sweden, please. <laughs> even here, for God's sake. So things that even if you could think about it, you wouldn't know where to start. So my point is, the thing that is really running you is this super gigabyte-powered brain and not that stupid inner monologue about why you're too fat to wear tights. Thank you. Thank you. But, you know, I know that, I know that, that the brain is running that, but it still feels like my thoughts are running the show. Like right now, right now I'm giving myself the worst reviews known to man. 
Yeah, I'll share with you some of my theme songs. Uh, nobody knows what I'm talking about. I'm not good enough. Everybody knows I'm making this up. My mother was right. <laughs> That's a really popular tune. <laughs> but I'll tell you something. The only reason I'm going on up here, the only reason I'm sticking around on this stage is because I know that everybody, everybody, no matter how rich you are, how powerful, how successful, everybody has those critical thoughts. Probably even Oprah has those thoughts. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why we're so mean to ourselves, really. <laughs> when did this start? When did the cruelty start like that? I mean, really, you wouldn't treat your pet as badly as you treat yourself. Because, look, hundreds of years ago, we were all peasants. Every one of us was a peasant, right? And then there was a king. Well, what'd you do if you were a peasant? You bred, you plowed, you died, shit happens. We didn't have a lot of laughs, but nobody wanted to be king. Now, everybody wants to be king. Everybody thinks they deserve, they deserve a shot at that one. This is the disease of this age, entitlement. And newspapers and magazines are going, come on, come on, you can try it. Sure, anything you dream about, you can have. This is why we get people on the X Factor with the talent of a toothpick. <laughs> or you get young girls who dream of being supermodels, ignoring the fact they are the size of Tibet. <laughs> or we get somebody like, I know it's a while ago, Sarah Palin. I know it's far back, but with the brain of a piece of toast, <laughs> who thinks she can run a country? In the old days, they would have catapulted her over the old village wall like an old dead plague horse. <laughs> <laughs> and Donald, <laughs> gone. But okay, as I said, it's not your thoughts. Of course, we want bigger and better. Those are the thoughts. It's the brain that's running the show. It's the chemicals that are spurting between the brains. That's what makes us do the things we do, think the way. And when the chemicals inform your body, they're called hormones, so chemical hormones. There's no neuroscientists here, same thing. <laughs> you know what really pisses me off? When people say things like, oh, it's just the hormones talking. <laughs> yeah, they say that about women who once a month go off the rails. Somebody once called me hormonal. <laughs> me. <laughs> just because a guy cut in front of me on the motorway and I threatened to rip his neck off with a hacksaw, I'm hormonal. <laughs> but ha, ha, ha. Everybody's hormonal. Everybody, men, chickens, children, buffaloes, pigs, weasels, elephants, moose, <laughs> owls, weasels, mosquitoes, dung beetles, toads. You cannot imagine how comfortable this is. Anyway, okay, we were talking about hormones, hormones and chemicals. I'll give you a few of my favorite things. So, <laughs> Julie Andrews again, talking about science. Here's a few <laughs> of my favorite chemicals. We all have about 100, okay, and they switch on and off for different occasions. So these are my faves. Uh, we have, some of you might know this, serotonin. This is the feel-good chemical. Uh, these type of people, they aren't people pleasers. They don't have to set their hair on fire to get attention. They're just happy being themselves. I have none of that drug. <laughs> no, nope, I have to buy it over a counter. <laughs> then we have oxytocin. These people are all runny and lovely and mumsy. <laughs> lovely, lovely. They always put other people in front of them. And you'll hear them in the back of the queue, they're always going, no, no, it's all right. I'm not in a hurry. They're usually English, going, I'm sorry, so sorry. Oh, I've dropped my own teeth, my fault, please. <laughs> My fault, I'm so sorry. Please hit me over the head, I don't deserve to live. Please, I'm so sorry. Really, I'm nothing. I'm tiny, tiny, but I have none of that drug. <laughs> but one of my big favorites is adrenaline. Oh yeah. Sometimes I call a taxi to take me to the airport, and when it gets to my house, then I start packing. <laughs> that one. That's a goodie. That's a good one. Yep, but my drug of choice is dopamine, because that gets a striving, driving, achieving. So it's probably what got me up here. And dopamine is a throwback from when we used to forage for nuts back in the bush. 
So we get a mouthful of these nuts, right? And then you get a huge spurt of dopamine. So before you even swallowed, you'd already be looking for terrains for nuts for later on. It would be forward planning. You don't understand. Okay. <laughs> I'll make it practical for you. Say I'm lusting after a pair of shoes and I want them really badly. So I'll see them in the shop and I'll get this dollop of dopamine. So before I even try them on, I'm already hunting for other shoe-rich environments. <laughs> and if I see a woman with a pair I might want, I may gnaw her ankle off. <laughs> But let me explain, it's not the nut, it's not the shoe we're after, it's the dopamine. That's, the chase is way better than the kill. So you could say we're all natural-born junkies, shooting ourselves up with our own hormones. It's like breaking bad. We all have a meth lab in our own basement. <laughs> but don't get me wrong, okay? We need this stuff, but in sensible doses. We need the dopamine, because without it, we wouldn't have progressed. Because it makes us strive. It made us strive to make fire. It made us strive to make tools. It makes us strive to put together a bookshelf from Ikea. <laughs> Thank you, Sweden. Still working on that one. Klitefenehen <laughs> is a drawer. I don't know. <laughs> yep, yeah, you got a lot to pay for there. Years of my life I've taken off. Anyway, the point is now we're always striving. That dopamine's always on because there's always something. It's low-hanging fruit in this culture. Something else to buy, something else to drive, something else to eat, something else to snort. So we're overflowing with this stuff. And if you get too much dopamine, it can seriously damage your health. It won't just stress you out, it will kill you. It's responsible, well, it contributes to certain cancers, contributes. Certain cancers, diabetes, two heart disease, infertility, and obesity and premature aging, all this you can give yourself. <laughs> That's the grenade in the cookie jar. We sabotage ourselves with our own thinking. Do you know by 2020, it's going to be stress that wipes us out? Can you believe this? There's people in the world who are being who are dying of hunger or they're being bombarded by war and disease, and we who have everything are killing ourselves off with our own thinking. Go figure. But wait, listen, listen. I'm not exempt from this. I swear to you, I'm not being holier than thou. I swear to God, I'm one of the biggest junkies I know. Really, honestly, if I told you how I live my life, you would feel really good about yourself. <laughs> really good. I will give you news. I, this is my day in a life. Okay, I will jolt up at 3 a.m. in the morning, usually, like an air raid siren just went off, with 40,000 things I have to do that second or the world will implode. And every morning there's the list. Every morning there's the list. <laughs> things like um, buy dog food, find turtle, uh, get the bath mats, worry about Ebola, cook the chicken, learn Chinese, call Suzanne, return the duvet, think about whales being ble beached in Malawi, do some exercise. So I find myself in downward dog, but I don't even know how I got there. <laughs> Then I, I look at a, this happened a while, I look at a, a calendar and it says, I have an appointment for something at 11 a.m. So it's about 10.15 and I'm not moving, I'm getting, getting, should be hurrying, but no, I'm moving around the house in slow motion. Slow, like I'm swimming through jam. Then the doorbell rings, so I scamper, slowly scamper over to it, and I open the door, and there is a delivery of the 150 blue and white striped cushions I had ordered six weeks earlier, because I'd gone on one of those domestic jags, you know, where I was humped over a, web, a nautical website for five days in a row, shaking. I couldn't even read my credit card. Shake, sweat running down me. You know, when I got the cushions, they were much smaller than they were in the picture. The size of a leaf of toilet paper. Anyway, I, I, was, I felt so guilty, you know, what with world poverty. So I started wrapping them all up, wrapping them all up. And I sent them back with a little note, with some extra money, little note in each package saying, here, feed your people. <laughs> they were going to Cornwall. Anyway, I couldn't. <laughs> so then I remembered the day before I had asked a plumber to come over at 10.20 just to give myself the pressure of a volcano about to erupt. So he comes over at about 10.31, and after giving me the history of boilers and me buying seven, I decide to take a shower for reasons of insanity. So now I'm in such a panic, I forget to open the glass door, so I smash into it and give myself a nosebleed. 
and now I'm really in a rush, so I ripped my underpants because I'm trying to get two legs in one hole. Okay, now it's about 10.44, I should be leaving the house, but no, I'm gonna answer some more spam. <laughs> Still no erectile dysfunction, but let's keep the communication going here. Now it's about 10.50 time, 55, I've lost my mind. I'm in my car, I'm driving the wrong way down a one-way street, and the devil voices in my head are now coming out of my mouth, and I'm going, screw you! Screw you! Your mother looks like a watermelon! I hope they tear her eyebrows off and they drop her from a helicopter. I don't know what I'm talking about. I don't know what I'm saying. Okay, I'm sorry. I have to tell you what the appointment was for. I was getting my nails painted. <laughs> and even worse, I was getting them painted blue. I'm killing pedestrians and children are flapping around on my wheels and I'm getting my nails painted. I'm thinking, what's the rush? They'll be blue when I die. <laughs> I have issues. I have issues. I don't know if you know that. Well, I have two issues, two issues you know about. One, I have depression, and I wrote a show about that. And then two, I have dandruff, <laughs> and I'm in the midst of writing a show about that. I'm thinking of calling it Flakes, <laughs> the musical. You know, I know I said this show was about um, this for everybody, you know, for everybody, but could I just talk to my own people just for one minute? Just let, indulge me, okay? You know who you are, the one in four, like it's that whole row there, and this man, definitely. And then there's a little cluster up there. Uh, you'll pick it up, okay. Um, about seven years ago, I had an epiphany when I realized that... Um, I realized that I, uh, with the blue and white striped cushions, I wasn't an inspired interior decorator, but I realized I had a touch of mental illness. <clears throat> I knew that because every time I'd buy something, purchase an item like that, immediately it would be replaced by something else. So as soon as I got the cushions, and I got them, okay, then it was a lampshade. Had to get the perfect lampshade, perfect lamp Then I got the lampshade, and it was bath towels. Bath I don't know if you know that they come in families now, there's like baby bath towels, and there's grandmother big fat bath towels, and there's brother and sister obese bath, big families in every color. Every, the only way I could get into my bathroom was by potholing. I once jumped out of a speeding car because there was a sign on the shop front that said, final sale, garden furniture. I don't even have a garden. So I realized that uh, this obsessive, frantic obsessions was, uh, I was trying to keep myself so busy so I wouldn't have to look at what's, what was going on in my mind. I was keeping my eye on the John Lewis website so I wouldn't have to notice the tsunami of depression that was about to whack me on the head. Um, of course it does in the end. In the end you will crash and burn. I mean, every time I obeyed something on the list, the list got even longer. So in the end, I was surrounded surrounded by the enemy, and then, of course, <laughs> found out the enemy was me. So I, I started to get those critical voices, you know, but it, it wasn't one critical voice. It was about 100,000 critical voices, like if the devil had Tourette's, that's what it would sound like. <laughs> so I thought, nope, I'm not going to end up in an institution again. That's got to stop. I mean, I... Uh, I, I didn't want to, I only had done it a few times. And I didn't want to end up on a chair for months on end, too terrified to get up. My brain, dark, dead, thinking the sun had eclipsed and it was never coming back. So I thought, well, this isn't going to happen again. So what I did was I did a lot of research to find out, okay, there is no cure for depression. Probably not. But maybe there's a way I could hear an early warning, you know, an early jungle drum. So I researched everything. And I went to scientific journals, books, whatever, and I found out that um, what had the best results was cognitive therapy and mindfulness. I never heard of these two. So I did the eight-week course. But, but the good news about mindfulness is, A, you do it on your own. B, um, you don't have to run to shrinks at 2 o'clock in the morning. And C, it's, eventually it's free. And being a Jew, that's half the cure. <laughs> so... Um, Anyway, I wanted to learn more about it, so I hunted down one of the founders of mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, and it was, he happened to be a professor at Oxford, so I drove to him, 
because I wanted to find my mom. I remember I was swerving, swerving, swerving into a lot of trees. I was not well, and when I got to him, I know I had a couple of pine cones hanging from my hair. And I said, just tell me, don't give me the fluffy stuff, just tell me what happens in the brain, explain it to me. What happens when you do whatever that thing is called? What goes on in there? And he said, well, unfortunately, if you want to learn about the brain stuff, you'd have to get your master's at Oxford. And because I have an extreme amount of dopamine, I got in and I graduated two years ago. So that's how I know this. <laughs> Thanks. 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 And here's what made it worth it. Here is what made it worth it to, take, to leave whatever I was doing. And I don't know why this information is not shouted from rooftops. I don't understand why this information isn't on the front of every headline every day of the week. That we can change, we can change the wiring in our brain by intentionally changing the way you think. I mean, they used to think we were set in stone, that the way you come into the world is how you go out, but it's not, it's not, it's not right anymore. That's not, the brain is always changing because it's malleable, because it's dependent on experience. It's 2015 and they have this information. It's, check it out. This is a fact. 2015, I never understand this. It's 2015 and I have a girlfriend. 2015, I have a girlfriend educated, went to university, and she told me that last summer, she went on a weekend workshop for how to heal your inner elf. <laughs> Let's picture what went on there. Probably a lot of hugging and hiding under mushrooms. <laughs> Must have been hideous. Hideous. Then I had another girlfriend, also educated, went to university. For my birthday, she sent me to somebody who told me about my past life. I don't know if any of you know this here, but in 1492, I was a window cleaner. <laughs> Thank you. Everybody else gets to be Nefertiti. I'm a window cleaner. <laughs> it's 2015, they have brain scanners now. You can look in there and see the real meat. You, that's, every time those neurons are wiring and unwiring, and every time they wire together, it corresponds to one of your thoughts or your feelings. And if you learn something, or you experience something new, those neurons start to get together, and that means you're laying down memory. But here's the bitch, if you start to do the same thing every day or you start to think the same way every, every day, those neurons get really hardwired. And then you start to, you develop a habit. And if you don't watch it, you start to think that that habit of, of thinking is who you are, that that is your identity. And then you've caged yourself. And again, if you don't watch out, your view of the world will get tighter and tighter and tighter till you see everything through a tiny pinhole and you start to think that your reality is everybody else's reality. Because nobody tells you that everything you look at, everything you see goes through a filter of just your memory. Like if I look at you for the first time, I'm not really seeing you, I'm holding you hostage to who you remind me of. Our minds are bigots. So if I was a kid and I had a bad experience with a guy with a mustache, I grew up, I hate everybody with a mustache. Now you can see why we're always at war. But the good news is, we can unwire those not helpful habits of thinking and make new connections that might give you a more flexible or, dare I say, happier life. And this is known as neuroplasticity. So Gloria Gaynor was wrong when she saw, sang that song, I am what I am. You aren't what you are. You have infinite possibilities. So she's gonna have to change those lyrics. It's not gonna be easy because what rhymes with neuroplasticity? <laughs> So anyway, the course I was on, I'm running on it, the course I was on was called Mindfulness, and I thought, oh my God, I'm gonna have to worship one of those elephants with a hundred, you know, the, sitting in their own nappy, <laughs> listening to that ting music, could make you crazy. Or I'd have to turn in one of those, you know, those extra large women who dance in the moonlight. You've seen them at festivals. A lot, lot of them here in Stockholm, huge. <laughs> you know them, tobangos they're dancing. Naked, usually, worshiping the solstice, burying their periods in a ditch. <laughs> There's some in here, I know who you are. Moon goddesses. <laughs> I never said that before. 
Anyway, it turns out with the mindfulness thing, a lot of you probably know this, all it is is it teaches you how to pay attention, to focus, so that your mind doesn't get caught in those endless loop tapes anymore. Well, I said too, and people say, well, what's with attention? I pay it. Okay, so some of you know, eat a piece of chocolate, you'll taste the first bite, but by the third, your mind is in Bulgaria. <laughs> Do you ever get in a car and then you get out and think, how did I just get here? Or you look in a mirror and you think, did I just have a life? <laughs> I've done that. I do that every morning. Every morning. So with the mindfulness, you learn a little bit about the brain. It's living in you. You might as well look at it. You know about other parts. 57 shades of gray. There's another one up here. I just made that up, but anyway. <laughs> Where did that go? Anyway, you know how it works. You notice if there's high stress winds or there's extreme critical thoughts, it means your amygdala is up. Everybody has one. You don't have to buy it on Amazon. It's up. So now you can learn to drive your mind rather than it drive you. Okay, so if you take your focus to one of your senses, this is easy, sight, sound, taste, you know what they are, you're activating a, com I'm making it simple, this is, you're activating a completely different part of your brain called the insula. Now, you can't have the amygdala on at the same time you have the insula. It's one or the other. So you either have the gabbling or you have that focus on a set. The gabbling, by the way, is never going to go away. The only time your mind is blank is when you're dead. But they get a little quieter. But the thing is, you've got to practice this. You know, it has to be repetition because that's the only way to break a habit. Here's the really hard part is... I always, when I look into my mind, you know, and I see the real garbage, because you have to look in there. Well, first of all, let me explain. You have to look in on what you're thinking. I mean, you check the weather outside, now you're just checking it inside. And when I look in there, it's always a mess, because there's the, my mother was right, I must be an idiot, the whole thing is going on. And this is when I give myself a real whipping. Because as human beings, this is our biggest glitch. We get stressed about stress, or angry, about being, I get depressed about being depressed. It's like you sent in the first arrow, that wasn't painful enough, so you have to whack in the second one to double the agony. Pain is pain, somebody said, but suffering is optional. So the thing is, here's the thing, you have to do it every day, okay? It's like physical exercise. You're not gonna get a six pack with one sit up. You, you, when I first went to the UK, people weren't even brushing their teeth. Now, the whole country's in a gym. Whole country pumping to get the six pack in England. What do they need? The, and they still have bad teeth. What do they need with the six pack? Like they're going to be in a Lynx ad when they go home or wear a little bikini top. We don't see that particular part of their anatomy, thank God. Anyway, the same thing. It's a mental exercise. You, you feel the critical voices. You go to it. It's just an exercise. You don't live like this. You go to the focus. And every time you do that sit-up, or mental sit-up, that insula gets more and more buff. So eventually, you, it's, more, it's easier to go to the sense. And eventually, you can use it as an anchor so that you watch the thoughts rather than obey their whims. And you start to notice that they come and go on their own volition, that thoughts aren't facts. And eventually, when those stress storms really blow in, you might be able to dodge some of those mental bullets. I mean, we're born with infinite possibilities, and we have no fear when we're young of trying anything. Like, I remember um, when I was really young, I had a friend, he wanted to be a fireman with absolutely no qualifications, and I wanted to be a mermaid. <laughs> and everything is novel when you're young. I remember I thought, I lived on a cloud, and I'd ask my girlfriend over for dinner, and she lived on a cloud. And so she'd bounce, 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 bounce from her cloud to my cloud, and then we'd have dinner. And when you're a kid, you're excited out of your mind in full living technicolor. And then you get older, and some fucker tells you you can't be a mermaid. So your view of the world gets tighter and tighter and tighter because you think you have no options and you end up in a rut. And of course, we don't seem to mind that we use so little of our brain. You know, we just go, oh, well, this is how I ended up. This was my fate. I was always going to end up like this. And then you get really old and they start to call you things like Bobo or Creek Creek or Tootles. They always name you after a pet when you get really old. 
and they go, isn't that cute? Toodles has her biscuits at three, and then she has her walkies at five and her Bettys at seven. Isn't that cute? It's not cute. She's losing her mind. Because you see, when you're curious or when you learn something, those neurons grow other neurons, more and more branches. And when you have a really dense forest of information, that's when you're most alive. But if you don't learn anything or you're not curious, those neurons just wither, wither away until you're just left with a couple of branches. And then you end up on a sofa watching reruns of CNN. <laughs> you want to not lose your mind? Grow some new neurons. Improvise your life. And then things will become novel again. Change the way you walk home. Change your friends. Change what you eat. Learn the tango. Parachute out of an airplane. You're old. What's the worst that can happen? <laughs> and in the end, and in the end, no matter how much you have to let go of, if you can look at something as if you're looking at it for the very first time, if you can really notice the novelty, then it'll outweigh how much stuff you accumulated and what job you had. And you might even end up a mermaid. So sometimes, sometimes, when I'm really focused on a sense, it, and it only happens for a few seconds, it only happens for a few, sometimes when I'm really focused, it feels like I'm sitting on the sand on the bottom of the ocean, and my busyness and my thoughts are on the surface. And so sometimes there's squalls and there's ripples and there's waves over, over here. I'm not even trying to be happy. It's just for a few seconds, it feels like I'm down there at one with the fish. So if you want to try this, a lot of you know this, but if you want to try it, uh, try it. But if you don't, please don't try this. So just for a minute, if you want to, we've done this before, come away from the back of your chair. We've done this before. OK, and you know, Alfred said, get your spine straight but not rigid and your head relaxed and your shoulders down. So now you're just playing with focus. It's not. This is not white sheet time. It's just focus. Again, we all have it. So take your focus and just bring it to the bottom of your feet so you feel both feet on the ground. OK, then let that go and just take your focus, your attention, and, and bring it to where your body is hitting the chair so you feel gravity pulling you down exactly where you imprint the chair. And then take your focus, let that go, to sound. So you're just listening. To the right, to the left, in front, behind. And pretty quickly, because this happens to everybody, your mind's going to be snared. It's supposed to, this is supposed and it'll take you away somewhere. Maybe you're labeling the sound or deciding you like it or you don't like it, or you're just fantasizing. As soon as you notice it, don't give yourself a hard time. That's the main thing. You just take the focus and bring it back to sound. And that's going to happen a hundred times, and a hundred times you bring it back. Okay, so let the sound go, and now just take your focus and bring it to your breath. Through your nose, your throat, your chest, just pick one area and stay with it. Again, at one time or another, your mind's going to take you. Everybody's does. Maybe you notice you're planning or you're thinking about tomorrow or yesterday. Or you're worrying. Again, the main thing is don't judge yourself. Don't give yourself a hard time. You just take your focus and bring it back to your breathing. You're not trying to achieve anything. You're not 
trying for any particular state. All you're doing is just paying attention. In this moment, and in this moment, and in this moment, and in this moment. Okay, thanks very much. Um, usually in the show, at this point, there's an interval and I tell everybody to go to the bar and then come back in again and we'll have a discussion because it worked really well in the mental institutions. <laughs> and they all come back in and there's question and answer. Do we have time for a couple questions? Okay, the two minute thing, you better tear up. We, we've gone way past. Um, okay, so just a few questions. Put the house lights up. Can you put the house lights up? Thank you. Okay. Yeah? A what? What? The what stop? My thoughts. Uh, well, they don't belong to you. They're, they're my thoughts. Yeah, but it's a, it's a it, listen, I'm making it so simple. I'm doing neuroscience for dummies. <laughs> yeah, it's much more complicated. Yeah. Are you a neuroscientist? I apologize. But otherwise, nobody will listen. <laughs> uh, well, you know, you, you have, uh, there's nobody up there. There's an autobiographical brain, you know, there's, um, sorry, memory. There's different, it's a zillion things are going on to keep you alive. Um, and maybe it gives you some meaning. Otherwise, really, we would flush ourselves along with Donald Trump. Um, so all of this is, you know, our evolution to keep us, keep the eggs rolling and keep the sperm coming. So, um, <laughs> I'm sorry, because I'm in Sweden, I've gone so... Uh, so it's much more complicated, but the thing is, we're so used to, of course, we're, again, as far as cognitive, we're, minds, we're so brilliant, but we're so sticky with those, um, with the thoughts. And again, it worked for us perfectly when there was an alarm and then we dealt with it, but we do live in a world, and a P.S., I'm not whining about it, because I always think, what are you whining? We put it there, now shut up. All we have to do is learn to navigate it. So part of it is the fear levels are so up that now, if we're going to evolve anymore, we have to get a technique. Otherwise, I mean, I wouldn't be up here. By 2020, we're all gone. And kids, you know, in my show, sometimes stand up and say uh, that they're beside themselves, and they're the most important ones, because in my day, we didn't have cutting. Um, so we got to get some technique. If mindfulness isn't for you, walk away because we're all fingerprints. Find your own thing. It's just I happen to study it. But um, we have to really learn now to take over the wheel because our minds aren't equipped for the 21st century. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah, yeah hi. Um, considering Jewish background, uh, are you saving good old Freud or are you killing him in your neuroscience? Uh, oh, there's a section I have on Freud, but I cut it out. <laughs> um, <laughs> You gotta see the whole show. Yeah, it's a, and buy the book. I've gotta go. <laughs> I'm hot. <laughs> Thank you.